<clears throat> Hi and welcome to chapter 6 of Tzotzi. Uh, we end at chapter 5 with the remaining members of the gang, the Arp and Butcher, going with Tzotzi into the city and noticing the smell or remarking to each other the, uh, about the smell that they noticed in Tzotzi's room. But Totti looking not quite so keen on his gang, but still taking them now into the city, which is where we pick up here. And we're going to see this gritty setting of the city again. And then this chapter is going to introduce a, a new character, a memorable but very sad character called Morris Chabalala. When Totti said city, he meant the open space formed by the junction of two streets near the gasworks. It was known officially as Terminal Place but people referred to it variously as the shopping centre because anything and everything could be bought in the small dimly lit shops that were crowded along the sides and from the hawker's carts parked in the gutter or the backyard because of its relationship to the rest of the city which was the white man's world. One wit had even referred to it as the quidrangle uh, a pun from, from quadrangle, but this quid referring to money. The sophisticated spoke simply of the beginning or the end, depending on which way they were traveling, because it was here that the buses with their bone-rattled multitudes, the crowds who were sitting getting their bones rattled in these buses on the, on the roads, the uneven roads, came together and parted on their endless traffic between the city and the townships. A few blocks away, if you walked with your back to the massive cooling towers of the gasworks, was the real city, the illuminated glittering arcades of the white man's world. It might just as well have been on the other side of the earth. The life of Terminal Place, the shopping centre, the backyard, the beginning or the end of so much this life started and stopped, faltered, hesitated, or was furious for its own intimate reasons. It starts early in the morning, so early that in winter that hour is still part of the night. The first bus comes with its headlights on and its passengers blinking owlishly at the world through the cobwebs of sleep. These are the first workers, and in the cold, steaming morning, breathing their ghosts, the condensation from their breath. They walk away into the city, hands in their pockets, the collars of their jackets turned up, and their shoulders hunched almost above their heads. A few of them have stayed behind to buy a tin of hot coffee and a fat cook, it's like fried bread, from the old woman on the corner. That looks a bit like a muffin. They stand around and drink gratefully, and tear off chews of the doughy cake with their teeth. When they talk, it is softly, the words thick with sleep and spoken at the back of the throat. Before they are finished, the second wave of buses has pulled in and sent another tide of black men hurrying through the streets. By the time it is light, terminal place is alive. The shops are opened, the hawkers have trundled up their carts and unpacked their wares. The pavements are bustling with women, fat with pride and progeny, progeny uh, fat with pride or fat with children, with men thin with poverty and persistence, and youth full of tease and tit. They bump each other, they buy from each other, bargaining, bantering, chatting all the time. They come together and part, Friends are seen for the first time in many years, or for the last time in just as many years. Many no longer look hopefully for the missing brother, or husband, or father. And through it all the buses still come and go. They travel urgently, jokingly, joltingly, tirelessly along the tentacled roots, tentacled like an octopus, flung far and wide, tapering away from the compact body to the last stops in the dusty, rutted roads of the townships.
The life of the place begins to decline in the late afternoon. The end starting when the windows, high and wide a few blocks away, burn gold with the last reflection of the setting sun. Night is near, and night is never safe. The fluid life of the pavement slows and thickens like porridge left too long on the fire. Windows are boarded up, doors are locked, the bus queues sag like slack ropes between the lampposts. The people go home. When it is finally empty, much later, much darker, the street sweepers drift through last of all, singing softly over the gentle rhythms of their brooms. It was interterminal place at half past six when the last of the day had turned those high windows into angry eyes that Tsotsi and the other two, that's Butcher and Diarp, rattled and roared on the 610 special, the bus, from the township. He left it 15 minutes later. He left it alone. He had lost the other two in the crowd, but he didn't care. He had found his victim, and he had a feeling for taking him alone. And now this little gap here tells us we into a different narrative now. Now we're going to find out about that victim. Poor Morris Chabalala. Morris Chabalala was his name, and he was also a man. But his stature, the extent of his manliness, was not in his body, because there was very little left of it since the accident. And we'll find out later what the accident was. And what there was left of his body, he dragged knee-high through the streets, using his arms like oars. Nor was it in his hope, because there was even less of that. How then did he measure himself as a man? Because he used that word, throwing it back at the children when they smiled, even though they had done so in pity, screaming at once at a prostitute who laughed at his money and desperation. Ask him, and he will tell you. Bend down low where he sits on the fringe of the forest of legs, rushing past on the pavement. This metaphor, the, the, the legs walking past her like trees because he's so low down because he's lost his legs. The forest of legs rushing past on the pavement. Better still, squat there so that he can look you straight in the eye. Don't smile, even in pity. Don't try to bribe him with a penny, because only then will he give you the measure of his manhood. I'll tell any man, any man, I tell you. I tell, go to hell, mister. Go to hell and cook for your black sins. Whatever else you could say or see about him, Morris Chabalala was not afraid. That is why, when the foot came down on his hand on the pavement of Terminal Place, he had no hesitation in saying in anger, Whelp of a yellow bitch! Pretty much saying son of a bitch. And the foot that steps on his hand by mistake, you'll see, is Totsi's foot. And funny, it's coincidental that his way of saying son of a bitch, that he uses these words yellow bitch, because of course this memory that Totsi had was of a yellow dog. But here, of course, Morris is just swearing at Totsi for standing on his hand. It wasn't because of the pain. His hands were hard now. His fingers had forgotten their disgust of the globs of phlegm or dog piss because they no longer felt them. It was the insult of the foot that stung him. It meant he had been seen, and nothing provoked so easily to life the harsh and bitter truth about himself. No one found half a man as meaningless as Morris Chabalala himself. Whelp of a yellow bitch, he cried, when the foot came down. Can't you look where you go? Usually they shook their heads and stepped aside. Some, some even commiserated or sympathized, calling him little father. Little father, they said, forgive me, but I did not see you, which only made matters worse. But this time it was different. The man said nothing, and he didn't move, not even to smile or scowl. He simply remained standing in front of the cripple on the pavement. Finding his way still blocked, Morris Chabalala threw back his head to swear again. 
but he didn't. He was moved to caution, something in the eyes looking down at him, as remote as mountain peaks, as cold, as sheer with threat, made him keep his peace. He satisfied himself with a grunt, swung his body to the left, and carried on his way. It wasn't fear. Morris Chabalala admitted to having known fear only once, and anything that did not add up to the terror of that moment was something else. And now we're going to find out what that accident was. It was the day the mine shaft collapsed. Day. It was day, but he was underground working in a mine. So it hardly looked like day. There was no sun down there. And by the same token, it was not night, because there was also no moon. It was altogether another world where time was a length of labor called a shift. And although the men changed, coming and going in helmeted gangs, the work never stopped, and the lights never went out, shining continuously on the damp, dripping sides of the shafts and the gleaming, sweat-wet bodies, so that it seemed as that everything was compounded of the same elemental stuff. A man was no more than a chunk of the earth that had torn itself away to hack and hammer and blast unceasingly at the body of his mother, his, his mother the earth. We are moles, they sang. We are become rats. The owl is my brother, the sun is a stranger and does not know me. The moon is a shy girl and has hidden her face, and dissatisfied wife has left my bed. And that's a reference to migrant labor. These guys are working on the mines. They've left their wives at home in the rural areas far away and have come to the city to earn money, to send home, but left the wife at home alone. They heard it, this noise of the accident, in silence, because the lights had gone out suddenly, and they'd stopped singing and working and were standing quite still. They knew it for what it was. Above ground, they spoke about it often, and those who knew it said it sounded like a rumble in the belly of a bull elephant. Khotso! Someone whispered, it has happened. And then they'd all run. Bedlam madness followed as they stumbled around in the dark, frantic and hysterical in their efforts to get away. If there'd been light, more might have survived. He might have escaped unscathed or unharmed because when they eventually found him and lifted up the heavy beam that had fallen across his legs, he was only a few yards from the spot where he'd been working. Am I getting old? He thought now. Does half a man get older quicker than a full one? Am I getting old that a child's eyes can silence me? By child's he means Totsi's. Of course here he's going to use the word Totsi, not knowing that Totsi likes to go by this name, but using this word to mean a gangster. Totsi, he said aloud and spat onto the pavement. Totsi shit, dog shit, mangy, dug, dry, yellow bit shit. Morris Chawalala was on his way to the eating house where he always had his supper. He moved slowly through the crowd. He moved slowly, normally, but a lot of people made it worse. There were times when he had to wait minutes on end before sufficient room opened up for him to carry on. He moved by putting his hands down in front of him, the palms flat, and then dragging his body forward between his arms. This position limited his gaze to the small area of ground immediately beneath his head, and a little more on each side, because he could turn his head either way. If he wanted to look anywhere else, he had to stop and sit upright with his stumps, what's left of his legs, sticking out in front. He was glad when he turned out of terminal place and into the deserted street. The paving stones were still warm under his calloused palms. This side of the street had had the sun from noon until a few minutes ago, when it had disappeared behind the thick belt of smog that ringed the city. 
Warm stones, he thought. I can still feel you, and I like to feel you. Anything that is warm, I like to feel, because once my legs went cold, and I learned that cold is the touch of death. Warm stones, how much longer will I feel you? My hands are dying on me because of the too much work in dragging me through the streets. Six years they've worked now, so it's six years since the accident. Yes, six years, and already there are parts as hard as the hooves of oxen, and though these parts no longer feel. That first year, the summer of the first year, my first day of that summer, when I left the hospital only half a man, then my hands felt everything. Oh, they felt the stones, and the hot tar, and the burning metal lids of the drains. And that night, when I picked the grit and dirt out of the broken blisters and cuts, then I cried and asked myself, was it not better that the coldness had gone beyond the hip, through my heart, and into my head, so that they had buried the lot of me? But then I found that butter soothed my hands, and it was easier. And the next day came and went, and now here I am, many, many days later, and my hands are hard, and only in some places do they still feel the warmth in these stones. I had a woman once, and when I fondled her breasts, I felt the warmth of life. He was halfway down the street when he stopped to rest. He examined his hands first, feeling one with the other, and the parts where his blackened nails made a hard, rasping sound on the calluses of too much work, feeling nothing in either. The silence was sweet, melting like butter on his sore thoughts. There were no reminders of the past or mirrors of the present. He looked back the way he had come. And unfortunately for him, who does he see? The same guy, Totsi. A man was sitting on the doorstep of a shop a little way down, scratching disinterestedly, as though he's not really interested in anything, on the pavement with a matchstick. Behind him, the chaos of Terminal Place was sorting itself out. The crowds were already much thinner since he'd left. There was enough room now for the greasy pages of newspaper that had held a sixpence worth of chips to waltz between the legs. Occasional gusts of the same wind came scurrying up the gutter. Small clouds of grey dust billowed up and then fell back exhausted by the effort. Things like empty matchboxes or crumpled balls of paper moved suddenly and for no reason, skipping away across half of the street to lie there, twitching furtively for a few seconds, until another irrational impulse carried them off at a tangent to their first move. It was a warm wind. Morris Chabalala felt it, screwing up his face each time a flurry of dust swept into it. He wiped away the grit that had collected in the corner of his eyes and then continued his journey. Once he started moving again, his face was even more exposed to the stinging clouds of dust, so he kept his eyes closed, opening them only occasionally to see that his path was clear. Why do I go on? he asked himself. I'm not better than a dog and slower. Why do I go on? It was a recurring question in his life. It had many forms, each of them sounding in their own way some new depth in the seas of disbelief and bitterness that swept him away from other men into his present loneliness. Is that all of me? He'd asked himself in hospital. It seemed so little he could easily imagine his legs jumping around someplace else and calling themselves Morris Chavalala. Another time he'd asked himself, what is there to live for now? The beam that had fallen on his legs had also come down like a guillotine on his life, severing or cutting him from all the purposes, the plans, the places he had known as a full man. They were gone. Those that hadn't left of their own accord he had left, turning his back on them the day he escaped without permission from the hospital. He still did it occasionally when he saw a face he knew or seemed to remember, turning away and hiding until the person was past. 
Why does my heart not die for the shame of my life? When we chopped off the heads of fowls in my youth, the bodies ran around a little longer. It is like that with me, only it's my legs that are gone. She stops and rests. And um, the city's looking grey and ashen. It's getting deserted. The dust and litter still rose. It had been a busy day. And there's Totsi. Much nearer Morris Chabalala. And sitting as he had sat earlier on the doorstep of a shop, scratching disinterestedly on the pavement with a matchstick, was the same man. At first he did not pay him any attention. Then Morris realized there was something strange about his being there. For a few more seconds it eluded him, it got away from him. Then he found it. The man sitting on the doorstep of the shop was roughly the same distance from him now as he'd been four blocks lower down. He examined him with quickened interest. There was something else about him. He also found that after a few minutes, he was the one who tramped on his hand in terminal place. They remained like that, the cripple and the young man, a long while. And in that time, Morris Chabalala saw many things, like the slim arrogance of the body, the soft idle hands, and the head that pretended not to look, but was doing so all the time. There was also time for other thoughts like, why did he choose me? And Totsi shit. And has he been with me all day counting my money? Then he dragged himself as quickly as he could to the crowded and well-lit main street of the city. The money, he thought, the money. I was right to despise it because he wants it. And if I'm not careful, he'll kill me for it. The money. But how else could I buy bread to eat and butter for my hands? Did I not try? Yes, you tried, Morris Chabalala. On that first day of the summer, six years ago, you tried and said, Mrs. Please, even if it's just the weeds in your garden. But you could see that they were not really looking at you. They pretended to be staring hard at something else on the ground, but not at you. And you knew already what it meant. When night came, we flashing back to what it was like soon after the accident. When night came and you picked the dirt out of your blisters, you were still without work. Having nothing else to do, you counted the pennies and few tickies, ten cent pieces, that had come your way and realized that there'd been five shillings, starting with the old woman with the white hair and the fat dog. Five shillings up to the last penny, and who'd that been? You hadn't even looked up to see, but thrown it away like the others. The old woman with the white hair and the fat dog. John, my poor boy! Morris met him. Johnny, you poor boy, what happened to your legs? Morris met him. Morris Chabalala. Does it hurt? Morris Chabalala, madam, is looking for work. Stop it, Biggles. She's still talking to the dog. Work, madam. Biggles, stop it. Come here. Anything, madam. Oh, these dogs. Your garden, madam. It's lovely. I'll weed it, madam. Good heavens, there are no weeds in my garden. Then she'd gone and come back with a penny, which she gave him. Afterwards, closing the door, and Morris Chabalala, because he was looking for work, not for charity, had thrown it away. Not many had given it to him like that, though, actually stooping down to drop the coin into his blistered palm. Most of them had simply fallen beside him out of the sky, falling hard and metallic, like the first drops of a sky that had promised the miracle of real relief, and then broken faith and blown away. And he, for his part, threw them all away because Morris Chabalala was looking for work. So it goes through for these first days. People just throwing money his way. And eventually he keeps the money. And it happened like this. He'd stopped with his sorrow and tears on a street corner. His hands were too sore to carry him any further. His heart too heavy to drag down another street in his fruitless search for work. 
The determination he had had when he left the hospital to survive as best he could was gone, and also his hope, even his desire to survive. He'd stopped on the corner, dragged himself into the doorway of an empty shop, out of the way of the hurrying feet, and for the first time that he could remember in many years, there were tears in his eyes. So not caring, he just sat and let them come, and the pennies had come falling down. I guess because he's crying, people are throwing money his way. He'd not even cared enough to throw them away, because he was too tired in his heart for even that. Hours later, many hours later in the time between day and night, when the streets emptied and were silent and windy, while the city waited for the moment to switch on its lights, then Morris Chabalala had looked down and considered the money. He was hungry and had spent the last of his money. He didn't have so much as a penny for a crust of bread. He had no work. He would get none. But he despised the money beside him. He despised it because of the way of giving and because he hadn't worked for it. And the people who got money they hadn't worked for were of a different breed from Morris Chavalala. So he has this moment of conscience. Is he going to take the money or not? It wasn't a long struggle. Maybe half an hour later, he started down the street and he despises himself for having taken the money. Once lost, that battle was never fought again. The next day he was back on that corner, and the days after it others, some better, some worse, until he learned, until he knew them all. The character of each corner he learned was different, and their times too. There was one which he sometimes worked late at night to catch the crowds from the bioscopes or cinemas. Bioscope cinemas. The same one was useless during the day, while the one near the market was only good for an early hour. Together with this, there were other things he had to learn, like choosing one spot and sticking to it, no matter how bad it seemed to be. At first, he sometimes wore himself out, trying one place after another and ending up with sore hands and little money. When all this knowledge had been acquired, Morris Chabalala never went hungry again, and always had money for butter until his hands no longer needed it, so it went on his bread instead. But there was one part of him that starved until death, and that was his pride. Although he filled his life and mind with the word man, he doubted it, and this doubt, working slow, taking its time in the years, the six of them had bred bitterness inwardly. His cup was flowing over. I tell you, any man, any man, I tell you, I tell, go to hell, mister. Go to hell and cook for your black sins. But there was no man in the world to tell this to. Even when he threw back his head and shouted it up at them, they were too far to hear. They only smiled and sometimes called him little father, little Baba, which was that word in his own language. Even the children, the youngest of them, those who just discovered their legs stood taller than Morris Chavalala. And I think we are back in the moment. Yes, we're back in the moment. So he's been thinking about uh, the accident and the early days and at the same time told us about them. But now we're back in the moment. On the street, is Tsotsi still behind him? Wants to go to supper at the Bantu eating house. When he stopped again, he'd negotiated two blocks of Main Street and had reached the corner where a lanky, tall, mournful-voiced individual sold newspapers, tall and thin, I think. Although they'd never spoken to each other, a nodding relationship had been established between them. The newspaper seller had been at that corner almost every evening for as many years as Morris Chabalala had been crawling down the busy street to his supper at the Bantu eating house, Bantu was a word that used to mean black person, back in apartheid South Africa. And this is spelled funny because it's telling you the, the, the dialect, the accent of the newspaper seller. What he's really saying is late edition. He's saying the late edition of the newspaper. But he says it like this, late edition, he called. 
A few minutes ago, a van had offloaded bundles of the newspapers. City edition. City edition. Late spot results. Uh, the sport results. He was doing good business. Attracted like motherless souls to his cry, white people stepped out of the throng. The crowd bought their paper and even as they scrutinized the headlines, were carried away again by the crowd shuffling past. For a few happy minutes, Morris Chabalala believed his fears to be unfounded. His fears that Tsotsi is still behind him are wrong and Tsotsi is gone. His pursuer wasn't to be seen. He strained his eyes to the f in the effort to see through the milling, aimless mob. But he was gone, either lost or grown tired and turned back. Lay edition, the lanky one lamented or said in the sad voice high over his head. In his own language, in an even sadder tone, he spoke to the cripple. They've shot a hole in the moon, Struis God, as Struis God, I've read. A hole in the old moon, Lady Dishan. He sold a few more papers. What's going to shine at night? He asked the world in general. During a pause in the business of selling, he dropped to his knees and cut the strings around a bundle of newspapers. What else do they say? Morris asked him. Irish Fancy by a length at 72. This is results of horse racing. Irish Fancy, the name of the horse, that's the gambling art, 72. She led all the way. He stood up. Lay edition spot results. They kept on buying. There seemed no end to the people who wanted to know about the moon, an Irish Fancy at 72. Morris Chabalala looked at them without charity. His awareness of the man following him had been a dead drag to his already tired body. But finding him gone had lightened his heart only momentarily. Finding Tsotsi gone only lasts for a short while. His freedom from anxiety became a freedom to realize with greater clarity than ever before the extent of his infirmity. He's come, come, coming to terms with the fact that the, this crippleness of his is really bad and the gulf that separated him from the rest of the unworried world. Had he been a man, he would have taken sticks and beaten the little bastard to death. Instead, he had to crawl away like a frightened dog with his tail between his legs. He looked at the street and the big cars with their white passengers warm inside like wonderful presents in bright boxes. And the carefree, ugly crowds of the pavement, seeing them all with baleful feelings. It's for your gold that I had to dig. That's what destroyed me. You're walking on stolen legs, all of you. And baleful, by the way, meaning destructive, hateful. Even in this, there was no satisfaction. As if knowing his thoughts, they stretched their thin, unsightly lips into bigger smiles, while the crude sounds of their language and laughter seemed even louder. A few of them, after buying a newspaper, dropped pennies in front of him. He looked the other way when he pocketed them. And this is where he sees Tsotsi again. He saw the man again quite by accident. Someone had dropped him a penny, and he was pretending to be looking at something across the street, while feeling around with his hand for the coin. The man was standing in the doorway of a shop, and he was watching the cripple now with frank and open interest. You stool of a whore, Morris murmured. You foul-smelling stool of a diseased whore. Morris Chabalala was a man, and now only half the man he was is still enough for you. The night is long and you'll need patience, dog. He thinks all this. He dropped them down. He dropped down onto his hands and shuffled off. The lanky said, Voiced one called out after him, Your money, little father. Go to hell, Morris thought. Little father, your penny. He threw the coin in front of Morris, who let it roll away into the gutter. Here I am safe, he was thinking. Where there's light and people, I'm safe. This world keeps its lights and people until late. He can still lose patience or meet friends. A policeman might stop him and ask for his pass back in apartheid. Non-white people needed to have a written pass a document to have permission to be in the white areas. 
Please, God, let a policeman stop him and ask for his pass. Now that he was on the other side, Morris was able to watch him without having to stop. For the first time in six years, the cripple did not notice the length of the street and the time it took him to reach the corner where he turned to the left. A lot of thoughts came to him, but ne many of them had no meaning. Are his hands soft? Has he got a mother? Didn't she love him? Did she sing him songs? He was really asking, how do men come to be what they become? Which I think is one of the central questions of this novel. How does Tzotzi end up as a Tzotzi? For all he knew, others might have asked the same question about himself. There were times when he didn't feel human. He knew he didn't look it. The small side street that would have brought him out near the eating house was an unanticipated and major problem. It was deserted and badly lit. Its very shortness was its danger because even when people turned into it, they were out again in a few seconds, and then it remained empty for a long time. Even if he were to follow someone in, he would be sure to be left alone. He knew from experience that even the slowest walker was too fast for him. On top of this was his hunger and thirst. Without realizing it, he'd been exerting himself and now his armpits were clammy and had soaked right through his old coat. Drops of sweat shone like jewelry on his wrists and throat. Tzotzi was still on the opposite side of the street, watching his victim through the gaps in the traffic rushing past. Morris knew that if he was caught in that street alone, it would be the end. There was a solution, of course, to leave the money at the first lamp post where it could be seen. He despised himself for this thought, almost as much as he despised himself a long time ago for taking the money. His salvation, what saves him, his salvation was announced by the blare of impatient hooters, and it came in the form of an old decrepit car that had stalled a little while down a busy street. So it's this car that stalls, it's got white people inside speaking, uh, and so Afrikaans voices, help it, yeah, Stephanus, that's the thing, I look at that. So what do we do? Push, man, it's not fine. He thought he's going to use this as a distraction to get into that street. The woman is smoking inside the car. And uh, that's what's wrong with the car. It's with the distributor. It's spelled funny because that's how they say it. And then they see uh, Tzotzi. I'm, I beg your pardon. They see Morris Chavalala and make a comment about him. And they use this K word, which was really offensive uh, to black people, referring to black people, an offensive, rude word used during apartheid. Ethel Fugot giving us a feeling of what it was like to hear this word all over the place. Look at that poor, mm, that K word, I don't even want to say it. There's shame, eh? You asked to find us. Okay, man, back to work. And so, Morris Chavalala follows behind them in their wake. And then here's the side street, which is more gritty settings. Uh, there's darker corridors, cement gray backyards, nondescript little businesses run by whites, Indians, and occasional colored. A mixed race person. All of them existing like small parasites on the lumbering, unconcerned body of Africa. In the rooms above them could be found everything from cast off white men lying on their beds and staring vacantly at the ceiling to shyster lawyers, crooked lawyers, and passbook racketeers, people who are making counterfeit passbooks, those passes that we mentioned earlier, and factories and warehouses and hostels for bachelor Africans and workers pouring like ants above the chaos of a broken heap. So it's through that car breaking down that Morris takes the gap and gets through that uh, side street and he gets to this Bantu eating house where he wanted to eat. More gritty settings here. In the Bantu eating house, Morris banged on the front of the counter and called up his order, dish of soup, penny extra, which meant you got a piece of meat floating in it and six breads with butter. 
the proprietor, Marcus de Souza, known to his customers as Souza, carried the soup and bread to a chair in the corner, which Morris used as his table. Sometimes he teased the cripple. Oh, it's business. You made a lot today. Bloody stinking lot of white people. Here's your money and go back. You rich. I know you're richer than me. Go on back. I tell you, leave a man to eat in peace. Tonight, Sousa was tired. And Morris hardly noticed him when he paid for his food. Here's the gritty setting. It was a cheerless room and reflected the poverty of a people who measured their essentials and excesses in the smallest unit of the white man's money. Everything's in units of one penny or one cent. Everything sold in the shop was a multiple of the humble penny. The bread went at two pence a slice. The pudding cake at three. Coffee was four pence a mug. The cold oily hunks of fish sold at five. Meatballs at six. And the soup at seven. These prices had been painted on the door of the Bantu eating house by Sam, the kitchen boy. He'd left out the penny sign beside each numeral. He didn't think it necessary. The room was furnished with long tables and flat wooden benches for seats. At one end was the counter. On it were two trays, the one holding the heavy black slabs of pudding cake, the other piled high with slices of bread. Usually there were four trays, but the fish and meatballs were sold out. The walls were somber or depressing dark green, and from the ceiling hung a few fly papers crusted over with the dry bodies of their victims, which you could see as metaphorical for the people living in South Africa at the time. They were the wrong color. The only decorations is a calendar, and the menu has been painted on the door. Morris ate his food in silence. When, he, when it was finished, he ordered another two slices of bread. When that was finished, he crawled to the door and looked out into the street. He saw lots of people that looked like the Tsotsi who'd followed him, but not one that seemed to be purposefully waiting or watching the eating house. He went back to his corner and ordered a mug of coffee. It was nine o'clock and he felt safe. The Bantu eating house closed at half past ten on Saturday nights. Three other men were at a table talking in low voices. From time to time, someone would come in, take something to eat or drink, and then leave again. Morris finally confessed to himself. You are frightened. He directed his thoughts at the rubbery reflection of his head in the mug of coffee. It was hot, and he blew on it before taking small sips. You are frightened. His reflection nodded up and down in agreement. You thought you had no fear, but tonight it was there like a worm in your bowels. A small fear of death. When the next thought came, it was so great he put the mug down on the chair and rested his head against the wall as if staring at the flypapers. And to me, this is the big lesson we learned from Morris Chavalala that even someone like him, who seemingly has so little to live for, realizes that he wants to carry on living. He rested his head against the wall as if staring at the flypapers. He saw nothing. I want to live. I didn't know it. I want to be on the streets again tomorrow. I want to sit through another day on another corner. I want to be coming back here tomorrow night for supper. What's left of me still wants to live. Friend, the voice was saying, you didn't hear me. I was thinking, not now, I mean at the corner. And it's the newspaper seller brings him that one penny that he threw after him. People will kill you for a penny. Morris puts the penny away, told the man about the Tsotsi who'd followed him. The thin man, the thin one, drew, threw down the crust of his last slice of bread, lit a cigarette and listened, uh, listened in silence. He had large, sorrowful eyes. That dogs, he said when Morris had finished. Mad dogs. They bite their own people. If I had my sticks, Morris said, and I was a man, I would have killed him. It wouldn't help. They'd hang you. It always happens. They always hang somebody. So what does a man do? Morris asked. The thin one stubbed out his cigarette and stood up. Go home, he said. Go home and pray to God on the way and thank God when you get there and don't see nothing. 
Morris finished what was left of his coffee, then went to the door. The street was almost empty. He could see no sign of the Totsi. D'Souza came behind him and looked over his head. He yawned and stretched. Tomorrow, he grumbled. Tomorrow and yesterday, hell. He blew his nose in a handkerchief. It's finished. Today's finished. I'm closing. With a sharp twist of fear, Morris heard the door slam behind him and the bolts rattle home, rattle closed. He'd been safe inside. Now he was in the street again. Still, he could see no sign of the man, and like the thin one said, you had to go home. There was nothing else to do, so he moved off. For some months now, home had been a derelict signal man's hut beside the railway line that some years ago had been used to carry goods to and from the factories in this area. It was no longer in use and would be torn up one fine day. Morris realized this but wasn't over-worried. His first months in the city had taught him that there was a never-ending collection of places to sleep. He'd already had half a dozen homes. To reach his present home, he had to slip down another side street and then along the loading bays of a factory. It was poorly lit. The lights were spaced at long intervals, and it was here that he realized that Sotsi was behind him again. He heard the footsteps and looking back saw him silhouetted in the light of one of the lamps. To reach the next light, Morris Chabalala had to crawl through a stretch of darkness. It seemed endless. He looked back repeatedly, expecting to hear the whisper of quick feet any minute. It took so long, and took so much of him, not counting the blood from the cracks on his hands, that when he reached the light, he smothered his tears and paused for breath. And then finding the brightest spot, he took out his money and held it high for the other one to see before putting it down. It lay like a small but lustrous silver spot in the dust. At the light after that, he looked back to see what would happen. And what he saw was more terrifying than anything he'd expected. The young man walked up to the heap of coins, looked down at them for a few seconds, and then kicked them, flying into the darkness, and came on after the cripple, who then started throwing stones. There were plenty lying around, and some of them were as big as a man's fist. Morris Chabalala had had powerful arms as a young man. Six years of dragging himself through the street had doubled that strength. He threw hard and with accuracy, stealing a few feet between every throw. It was a good idea because if he'd hit the young man once, it would have been the end of him. As it was, all he succeeded in doing was to make him jump once or twice and duck when they came hurling towards his head, rebounding harmlessly further down and skipping off into the darkness. Crawling forward after one such throw, Morris Chabalala looked back and could see him no more. He knew then that the young man was keeping to the shadows and darkness, and at that moment was near. If I can't see him, he can hear me. And it was with that thought that he started swearing. He filled the night with obscenities, roaring them between his tears, throwing the words with even more violence than the stones. He kept it up until his voice cracked and it was only a whisper. And was only a whisper. A few minutes later, a few more feet, and he was at the final darkness beyond the last light, and he knew that he'd come to the moment and the place for which the young one had waited so patiently the whole night. And the actual confrontation between Morris and uh, Totsi happens in the next chapter, which is going to be chapter 7. And I look forward to seeing you then. I wish you a happy day until then. Goodbye.